This is the heart is always hungry. Like watching a bird fly backward, learning to see is lonely, a folded corner worth coming back to. Headless, we become form, placeholders for ideas and fluttering reflections to study as sculpture, writing on the wall. I wanted to live in your throat, turned into a songbird that flew in an open window, as though unaccompanied in this life. I wanted to weave a yarn you would listen to, write a poem you would understand, give you an apple I pulled from my tree. When it's gold and ripe, like glittering cities in rear view mirrors, it should fall into my hand. All right. Uh, welcome to another episode of Poets in Montana. You've just heard uh, Anna Page uh, hey. <laughs> read you a poem. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed the title again, Anna. It is called The Heart is Always Hungry. I wrote that in 2019, actually, as a collaborative um, project for Donna Forbes on her 90th birthday. Um, Donna was uh, the um, main mover and shaker behind the Yellowstone Art Museum. And uh, to celebrate her birthday, a lot of artists came together to um, give her gifts um, in a, um, and this was one of them. And I can actually share the um, collage that this uh, poem was inspired by. Um, it's one uh, that I did in collaboration with um, Matthew Taggart, who is uh, a collage artist and also my partner. We uh, gave this gift of poetry and collage. And it was a really fun project because I was able to collect the source material and then Matt collaged um, the work together. And then after he finished that piece, I then wrote the poem and uh, really wanted to get this idea of like headless, we become form, placeholders for ideas, just sort of this longing and that idea of, you know, the golden ripe apple is like glittering cities that you look back on and, and lament. Um, when the time is right, it all falls into your hand. So that's a uh, um, that's where that piece came from. So, so the, the, so it was, uh, the poem was, uh, uh written purely as from, from the, the collage was finished. You then went to the piece and that inspired the poem. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was fun to work back and forth between different materials to take, uh, you know, a, a visual and then make something and also just kind of uh, wanting to celebrate the legacy and the beauty of, of uh, a Montana um, artist who's done so much for the community here in Billings. Um, uh, it was just a wonderful thing to get to get together and, and celebrate her and, and share that gift of poetry. So yeah, I'm sure she I'm sure she really appreciated that. And and so several uh, uh, this was like a, a big celebration. Several people did the similar kind of a project. Yeah, well, it was just open to um, artists as how they wanted to do writer letters, painter paintings, and it all has been archived by um, Gordon McConnell, longtime friend of Donna's, who was also the curator at the art museum. Gordon's done some incredible um, artistic work um, for for decades, and so he kind of collected all of those items together. Ekphrasis has been a fun way for me to do poetry because it gives you these prompts. Uh, it allows you to collaborate with other artists. Um, we were sharing you and you and I, Mark, were sharing poems um, back and forth, and you really liked this poem, "Pretty Penny," and it was another collaborative project um, that we did together. Um, it was, we basically, there were four poets and um, four collage artists and we all shared material together. And then when we displayed the, the collages and shared the poetry, we did it in um, an event space where we literally moved our living rooms into this um, performance venue. So there were four different living rooms. John Lodge, who is an incredible patron of the arts here, sponsored a moving company they came to our houses, moved our living rooms, and uh, people were able to interact in each of our unique spaces. I had my rug rolled out, my couch, all my family pictures. As you can tell I, by my background, I love plants and I'm just a homey, uh, nesty kind of person. So, but yeah, that's where that um, the, col the collage and the poem Pretty Penny came from. And I'm happy to share that too. I know we talked about sharing that one. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I I, I uh, have taught uh, kids well, mainly in the, in the schools more than anywhere for a long time now, and of course that's always been sort of a staple exercise you know this i call them picture poems before i even knew had ever heard of the word ekphrastics but it's you know so so it is that that idea <laughs> right? of, of writing a poem out of the experience of art some kind of a piece of art regardless of what the art form may be could be an ekphrastics poem and and uh yeah i mean i always just got these great great poems out of kids who would you just give them images and uh, pieces of art and and then they they uh, they'll come up with with a poem out of it it's a, it is maybe one of the you know I've never even though I've done this for a long time I've never been super like oh prompts are the way to go but an ekphrastics kind of a prompt is like probably as good a prompt as you can give anybody for writing a poem yeah, I agree with the teaching. Uh, with Tammy Holland, we co-founded Young Poets here in Billings, and we teach uh, poetry, primarily third through fifth. And one of my favorite lessons was, is when I bring an artist or a musician into the classroom, and they then write poetry from that stimuli. They'll listen to a musician play and pick colors and sounds and words that come to mind from the music. Same with visual arts. Uh, it's a great way to show them that everything they need, they contain within themselves. And we're just learning tools to bring it out. Right, right, yeah. And so, uh, well, if you, uh you want to go ahead and share the uh, the pretty penny and then and yeah let's do it it's got a lot of peas in it so let's see if i can <laughs> not get tongue tied <laughs> i have had plenty of coffee so <laughs> all right and i can also just show you the um the collage it was inspired by this is another um, work by Matthew Taggart. Um, he and I do a lot of work together in the sound um, world. So this one is called Pretty Penny. Stick out your neck, pretty. Let us see your throat. Chin up, your picture perfect in that power pose. Pretty pompous though, pretentious even with all your preconceptions. You're a particularly precious peach, a palatable pumpkin, a little petunia. You prattle and pray, prick and pout. You're persuasive, primed, pumped and preened, a potent package of prerogatives and presumptions, a pretty penny that just needs some polish. <laughs> Lots of peas. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun one. You know, just playing with the idea of, you know, the the female form and this sort of glamorized idealistic sense. And of course, women aren't supposed to be that outspoken. So, you know, <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun with that one. I, I use my poetry for various ways of expressing myself, but certainly to um, point out um, how uh, women are oftentimes wanting to be just uh, seen and not heard. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, it is. It was interesting to uh, to uh, having having read the having read the poem, uh, you know, on the page. And I think I think that you had sent uh, the image along with the poem. And I so I, I was, but it was I printed it off on my my printer, right, my black and white laser printer. And and so it, it wasn't a color image. It was it was and it was a much smaller sort of image. So and being just a basically for the most part someone that's a connoisseur of words in a way i mean I, that's what i'm focused on right when i so i i, I just read the poem and and i read and of course the poem is so sound driven i was really yeah. into the to the p -p 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 poem you know <laughs> of the poem and whatnot so this time when you gave me the image to look at and then you read the poem it was a completely different experience and and uh you know just based on who the hell i am and my own personal experiences i have to say that you know it was like more 
than I actually, the image was like, when I was listening to you read the poem this time, was more than I actually wanted. Because yep. the, I my can see first that. experience, I was holding on to more so, I have no idea how the brain works that way. But I do know, I mean, I just kind of went through a, one of these interviews with Charles Finn, who's been touring with Barbara Michaelman. And oh, yes, I just interviewed them. And that's literally what I was thinking is that their book, of poetry and these beautiful black and white photos by Barbara, it was turned down. A publisher wouldn't even look at it because she said, if you need a picture to support your poetry, I'm not interested in it. Yeah. And I thought that was really fascinating how they combined um, uh, poems that, um, that said more than the photography photograph and that together they they enhance one another and yeah you're right mark i'm i'm definitely a sound poet versus a page poet and um i love your feedback on that because that particular poem and that particular piece of art were presented somewhat separately you know that it was presented in this living room context where people were walking through interacting and mingling and then we spoke those poems out loud as people were watching us and so it was more of a subtle connection between the two so yeah when a poem stands on its own um on its own two feet that's when i think i i know i've, I've done my job yeah well and i i think that 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 it, that it has to i mean uh, uh that the poem has to stand on its own two feet the collage the photograph the the graphic art has to stand whatever sculpture has to stand on its own two feet sometimes the marriage of the two together that, in a sense, is an art form in and of itself. I mean, so it's like that book that that Charles and Barbara put together. That is a really incredibly successful marriage of art and words that work that work so well to each other, and they don't really impose on each other in any way, shape, or form. They don't detract from one another. It, it's a weird thing how how sometimes, it's like super, super important that, that this is, it's like a totally different art form. And then other times it's like, wow, I would, I would just as soon just bury myself in that painting or, or I would just as soon hear that poem and I don't need the painting there for that experience. Yeah. It's, it's like great journalism or anything else. You don't want to over explain and you don't want to treat the reader like like an idiot either and you know in the case of Charles and Barbara that was a 10-year collaboration mm -hmm. and I think you know there's some projects that are what I call artists artists projects that get a little um you know you just dive in with your artist friends and make something for the sake of it mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about sculpture I wanted to share something that I just recently did um and it definitely is hard to describe and, and requires some visuals but with um a sculptural artist Phoebe Nap, we did a, a performance in um, this uh, sculpture that is called Tomb, and it's built on the um, the irrational number phi. So every single angle in this box box is an homage to phi and it's three boxes within itself so it sort of nests within itself and we did a performance uh inside of it i'll share with you um what it looks like from the inside and it, when i was in there it felt like being in a it, at home it felt so comfortable um strangely enough even though you were retracting within the tomb uh, it it felt open and Phoebe also built this box based on um, the subterranean tomb she saw on the um, uh, in Rome on the I believe on the um, Apian way and so you know kind of keeping the slats open um, for the uh, the world to kind of flow in and out and then on the very inner box um, we had a, a violinist, a friend of mine, uh, Lee Below. She ends up in the very inner chamber and you can see how tight it is. And Lee played a collaborative violin and I did poetry and used guitar pedal. So these are some of the things I've been playing around with lately that really get me going. But they're, they're um, you know, ex exploratory in the art of sound and pairing words 
And uh, that's that was a fun one. But yeah, working in a sculpture like that, the moment I saw that sculpture, I thought, I have to do something in this piece. Yeah, no, well, that's very cool. Very, very, uh, and, and the whole collaborative aspect is, is always a, a fun thing to do, I think. Uh, yeah, it's really what drives I, me. Pardon me? I feel like that's my driving force is I, I love working with other people, being that connector, whether it's teaching poetry in the elementary schools and bringing, you know, different, um, you know, poets that they might have not been exposed to or artists and, um, or, you know, working with other people in the visual or the sound realm. My words don't necessarily um, stick to a page. And I find that I struggle with that, um, being not as well published for poetry. My journalism is well published throughout the state, but I've never really focused on um, committing to the word on the page. And I have a great respect for, for poets who can do that, who can publish and, and really be happy with their, their work that way. I feel like sometimes my, my poetry just is this living thing that I, I don't ever wanna put <laughs> into into print and commit to i don't know what that is but well yeah i i don't i don't you know I don't either i mean we we think of we think of uh of it as you know we have the we have the canon behind us and we have yeah yeah we, we think of of putting it down and it's there and it's it's going to be there after we're gone and and all of that but uh i don't you know i mean eventually you know, I mean, all you got to do is look out at the universe and you understand that eventually it's all dust. It's all right. garbage. <laughs> garbage My shoot. It's all going to disappear. It's all a sand mandala. And it just takes a lot longer to blow that shit away, you know. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. It, it, you know, it, but but it is, uh, you know, I mean, part of it is, uh, I mean, I fell in love with poetry on the page just because of the way it looks. Uh, I love that white space and I, I love the the letters and the images and and that aspect of it so I mean I became fascinated I think with poetry e even though I didn't consciously know that or understand that back then when I did but it was just that it was just that spare it was just that trying to get to the point of mm. what the hell you can't say but want to say in so few words on this sea of white. And for some reason, that was just very attractive to me. So I became fascinated with that aspect before I even was aware of it, I think, you know. Yeah, I've always been called to journalism more than anything. And I think that I that curiosity is what what writers must contain constantly. But journalism, you have to be very efficient with your words. And you also have to, um, you know, paint a a, a vivid picture while still, you know, using uh, clean and concise language. So I think it translated for me easily into poetry, um, just the art of writing in and of itself and, and approaching things as a storyteller. And as a person who is collecting dialogue, a lot of my poems uh, contain found dialogue or concepts that I'm sitting in and wrestling with. Um, I can share with you the words from um, that that collaborative piece in Phoebe Knapp's tomb, because it is what you're talking about. It's that sparseness. And I almost wonder if I am gravitating to sound because I like to overwhelm in some ways too. And it's such a fine balance between what the words are trying to say and then what you add to it to create a feeling. And lately my words have just been um, trying to create feeling more than anything. Um, yeah, so, I think that's poetry's job, basically. Yeah, it's trying yeah. to express the inexpressible, and and that's pretty difficult in words. Uh, so uh, is uh, I mean I, I have a couple of tracks uh, running in my head right now. Uh, you know, I know we. Do you want to share that poem from Tomb first, and then then I want to ask a little bit more uh, related to the whole journalism uh, end of things. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this one, um, just picture some beautiful violin behind it. But um, oh. these, are, these are the um, words that I used for um, what we then termed entombed. So this is entombed. Think of something beautiful, then close the sky. 
These wounds are stitched together, a king thread to a violent world, colliding plates and fingers jutting from the bottom of the inland seam. We are not islands, we are sand, endless. When there was still sky, before the time of forgetful mother, an absent father, before it was even a language, we let ourselves slip off stone, held hands while the forest roots grew long. We swam in snow so cold our bones rang, an inelegant breaststroke at the confluence of two streams, sky our only witness. You are here, this undulating violence, eons of destruction and resurrection, this everyday survival, the way we die a bit at a time, the sacrificial limbs, one arm dead in the night, that slick sadness given to pleasure, to pain, random acts of affection. He wants to carry a gun because everyone else is, if something were to happen, we would just die, she says. We would just die. I've tried to kill those seeds you planted, each time heaving as if I could be your God. As if I could be anything but your father. Lick the salt from your cheeks, forgetting your bones are brittle like mine. Like the girl who pinned you down, first touched you while your ribs screamed. Since then, how many ribs have you broken looking for that missing piece? The white and yellow of you showing. I can still picture that nurse, face cast down with a red cross at her arms, holding all this grief like a prize. When you died, we did not gather. Did I love you enough to switch places? This is what it costs. Leave the gardens before the freeze. We are too tired to bring the fruit inside. Let the brambles of us grow wild for these desires are just as empty. Silver and breathless, you have only forgotten yourself for a moment, for that urge to die is only a series of moments, that little bit of blood, that tired spill of a wandering river atop roots older than the world, a runoff that meets the fork, the place of remembering. Nice. I think that's a that's great. That's a great poem. It does, you know. I mean, it doesn't that that. Uh, and you have a great voice. You 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 know. You read it really nicely. I think. I was yeah. That's. I mean, that's not a. That's a that's a goddamn good poem. I don't know what it looks. Like. <laughs> Thank what, you. What it I, looks like. You know, in performance, sometimes there's a lot more space in it, right? And so there's these vignettes, these moments, and so. Um, I, I took that obviously inspired by this idea we were just talking about, about that everything is going to be dust and nothing. What are we? We're nothing. We're going to die. And so, uh, and, and tomb itself is this, is this idea of, of being entombed and that um, really uh, memento mori, live for today because you're going to die. And, and I think that's been pushing my creative work into the world because we just don't know. We've all lost so many people in so many different ways and, and we can't gather or we didn't gather and, and, and all of that influences our hearts. And I guess if I, can, if I can share that and feel less alone in it and then leaving something like that in tomb and then being able to speak it out loud, it becomes somebody else's I give that away and it's not mine anymore so then I don't I don't own that work I I've, I've given it out and and that to me is very freeing yeah yeah well I, I, and I, I you know and in terms of the argument for uh the poetry to stand alone as poetry in the world I think that that uh you know maybe some of that uh, maybe some of that for me has to do with the, the fact that I'm an older bugger at this point and, and that, uh, that this whole uh, digital and, and the fact that we have all of these incredible tools at our fingertips now to be able to do a lot of different things that we never could have done, say, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, yeah. uh, back when, when uh, and, and then the, and the other part of it that I that I say in my head in this idea of poetry being something that 
that that I believe uh, can stand alone and should stand alone uh, is this whole idea of just being alone and and being uh, in the world as a single human being isolated somewhere without any ability. And it is that connection. It's that connection to another human voice out of time and out of place that I can then sit with and I can make it my own by reading that out loud and to myself. And, and I think that's very, very important. I think that's a very, very important form of communication because of the fact that really good goddamn poetry tries to connect to the emotional link between people that we can't really articulate, but we're gonna try. Yes, you yes. Know? Well, at, the whole world can change in the turn of a poem. Yeah. Some of my uh, favorite work right now is Ada Lamone. She's the new uh, poet laureate of the United States. And her book is called The Hurting Kind. And there's so much relatability in it. And as a, a, a poet who gravitates towards the environmental influences, the way that the hurting kind is structured around fall, summer, spring, and winter, just the ideas of how seasonality affects us as human beings. And the more disconnected we come from, from our place and from the land, I think the more harmful we can we can be to it. Mm -hmm. And so if even if through it, di digital forms, I'm sharing that relationship mm -hmm. and a lot of, I'm the last of the analogs. I was born in 1980. I grew up in an analog childhood and I came of age in a digital world. And just a few years after that, there are um, young people who grew up exclusively digital. So mm -hmm. I like to think of myself as a translator between those worlds and to understand that there are different forms in which people are gonna consume ideas. And back to teaching young people poetry, it's not this, um, inaccessible thing it's a tool that they were born with it's the metric of the heart we are all poets because i hear people say that all the time oh i'm i'm not a poet and i said everybody has that within them oh, yeah. and so i like to empower people to share themselves develop a relationship with writing because gosh knows that the more that you can get in touch with yourself and your feelings about complex emotions the better human you're going to be in this world so i'm all for everybody writing poetry exactly yeah that's the more poetry the better i mean poetry is is the expression of what it is to be a human being and yeah. and every human being is a human being so that makes every human being a poet you're absolutely right yeah yeah so i mean i i'm totally i i've been telling kids that for years and and uh, and they've been proving me right over and over again you know and yeah there's some of the best poets i know adults you know who have like oh i, I don't know i don't read no oh, i'm not really a, no they're they're just terrified of poetry older adults a lot of them they don't know and then and then they you you show these kid poems to them and they're like what you know it's like no that you can do the same thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They and they can, but they just, uh, you know, it, it, the older we get, the more closer we play those cards to the chest because we know how brutal uh, uh, we can be toward one another in the world and people. And poetry, it really, at its heart, has to be honest. It has to be vulnerable, whether it makes any damn sense or not. It right. has to be putting the heart and the blood on the page, right? And, yeah. So yeah, no, I, I, no, I was, I, I, and I, I agree, I agree that that uh, the, the more the bear, the better in the world, and all of these collaborative efforts are just another blossoming explosion for art and interactive art and better emotional communication across time and in the world. And now that we are able to do that, the more the merrier. But still there's that argument for the fact that a written poem on the page is something to be valued and 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 held on to so you need to you need to write those down and put them in a goddamn book <laughs> i did have a friend look at me because i was telling her about a book i want to write and i have been struggling professionally to find my place after leaving uh, the Billings Gazette and leaving journalism about a year ago. Um, I am a writer. I'm called to it. And um, she looked me dead pan and she says, Anna, you know, you're going to die, right? 
And I was like, oh, so write the book. Yeah. And and for me, I think I, I am a fan of documentation. And so a lot of this work gets documented um, in, in the digital space. But I, I definitely think my next great push will be to get some of my creative work uh, published. Yeah. Uh, I, I also have been uh, moving towards the poetic essay uh, and just kind of taking um, that marriage of, of journalism and storytelling and poetry and putting them together. And uh, I have a piece I've been working on for several years uh, that was developed in COVID. And uh, it's some of my, my most um, intensely beautiful work and I'm very proud of that but it's different right it's it's a it's a it some of it doesn't make sense and if you're in a if you're in a short form story it has to be relatable so I'd love to share some of that with you too if you're feeling it yeah yeah yo oh, totally uh but it is a uh you know I mean that's what what is the we had this conversation with several people too in terms of the prose poem because it's a very popular form you know over the last decade or more i suppose but definitely over the last 10 to 20 years the prose poem has kind of you know blossomed uh in, into its prominence in in poetry and you know I, I so much of the prose poem seems just like flash fiction to me this it's a very very short uh prose looking poetic language kind of an experience that really has no definition that I know of. I've heard a lot of people, I've asked people this over the years and they've given, tried to give me these definitions of what a prose poem is. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever yeah, you say, I've seen a variety of them and they're all different, you know, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. So yeah, if, if anything goes, you know, in, in regard to earlier and and because I, I was going to I'm going to ask you a brief uh, couple of questions in regard to your journalistic career and, and basically how we met and your background. But but one you know, when you mentioned journalism earlier, I flashed on, you know, I mean, probably of my generation, the most famous journalist was Hemingway. Right. And so. And, and I think about Hemingway and, and his legacy and after the fact and all this in terms of uh, his art, his work, the body of his work. For me, what, what I loved the most about Hemingway's work were those short stories, those very, very short stories, that, that language that was, it was very spare. It was very yeah. contained. A lot of it was left unsaid. And it just got to the point and they created these little, in, uh, were really uh, emotional, uh, like poems. I thought they were like poems. I think he's maybe the first prose poet in a way. Uh, yeah. Those little short stories that, that he did. And, he, and that was, of course, training on the, on the field of journalism, which is where you've been, which is where we met. Yes. You, I, I, you, yeah. When they, when the, when they gave me the laurel wreath assignment, as <laughs> the, the, yes, the statewide, uh, um, poet celebrity of the year. I love, I love that, um, you know, we get this yearly opportunity to celebrate a new poet and, um, I, or is your term more than a year? It's I can't a, remember. It's a two year term. Two year term. term. Yeah. Two year yeah. Term. And I think poetry doesn't get celebrated enough. So thank goodness it's still got a place at the state and the national level where we're, we're celebrating um, poetry on that on that on that scale. But yeah, I've thought about Hemingway a lot too, like um, especially because there's been a rise in um, fictionalized uh, stories about Hemingway's life and his wives and and. Um, uh, he's, you know, he's been made into uh, comic books. And I mean, people just love to talk about Hemingway's experience in the world. And I thought, you know, would I be that type of person at that time period, you know, throwing my Corona typewriter down the stairs and, and you know, smoking and drinking my way through cafes and, <laughs> you know, ending up going mad in the keys uh, with my pterodactyl cats. I don't know. I mean, I think we, we all want to relate to that, but I agree that there's a sparseness to that that's really important um, in his work. And I have the heart of a storyteller, and that's why I love getting to know people that way. 
Um, I think the more curious and open you are, the more that people will trust you with their very intimate selves. And that to me has been very important to be trusted with so many stories of our community. Yeah, so, so briefly, uh, just as kind of background information, uh, where, where are you a, a lifetime Billings resident or where you hail from? Or? Yeah, I grew up in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, it is smack dab in the middle of the state in a windy little armpit, I like to call it. <laughs> I get to say that because I'm from there. Yeah. Um, it, you know, and I think Casper gave me a lot of my DIY nature, that do-it-yourself, gritty punk rock culture we grew up with in the 80s and 90s. There wasn't um, a lot going on in our town. And so you really had to make it yourself. And so I've, for as long as I can remember, I've been writing uh really bad poetry when I was young and I mean you know we still write really bad poetry you just kind of learn what lands and what doesn't the more that you do it and there's no great secret you just you just keep doing it um but yeah Billings actually is the largest city I have lived in and I came here from uh Sheridan Wyoming where I was interning after getting my undergraduate degree as a photojournalist in Sheridan Wyoming uh, my first undergraduate degree at the University of Wyoming was cultural anthropology, and I think that just speaks to how curious I've always been. I have always been fascinated in humanity and the study of, of who we are and what we leave behind. And then um, I just really couldn't do much with that uh, degree unless I wanted to teach and go uh, into higher ed. So journalism was an easy land for me. I went back for one year and got a journalism degree at the University of Wyoming, was a staff photographer at Sheridan Press and really just wanted to be somewhere bigger, a bigger newspaper. So the Billings Gazette brought me to Billings oh. and I've had a, a tumultuous relationship with the Billings Gazette ever since uh, because I spent my first pr five years at the newspaper and then comes 2008, 2009, when papers really started struggling. I mean, it it hit hard and it hit fast um, for the Billings Gazette. And they started laying off people, myself included, in about 2008, 2009. And they just haven't stopped. Uh, the erosion of newsrooms across the country is, is a a whole conversation that we won't dive into because I could talk for yeah. hours on what it means to lose journalists in your local communities. But I came back to the Gazette a decade later um, when their arts and entertainment beat opened up. And that really became the, the home. That was my home. Arts journalism was my calling. It was something I've been doing all along, photographing and documenting the arts community. And so to find myself suddenly tasked with being responsible for the statewide um, journalistic <laughs> output uh, for the arts, it was a big responsibility and a role that I took very seriously. And I continue to do that today. I did leave the Gazette because it was too difficult to maintain um, that station for me. And I didn't want to work for a company that didn't value their people. I helped lead the newsroom through unionizing efforts. And, uh, and after that, I knew I'd left it a better place than I came into it and uh, went into the nonprofit world for a little bit, but writing is calling me back. So. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, that's uh... a, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, well, we, 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 yeah, that we could take up another hour if we <laughs> go down that rabbit hole of, of what's, what's wrong with, with uh, the death of journalism in America. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so you, you, you grew up in, in Wyoming. Well, let's, I mean, you know, uh, I, I have not spent a lot of time down there. Interestingly enough, I did spend some time in Sheridan 50 years ago. So oh, I, yeah like right out of high school, you know, I, I went down there, I worked at the, uh, the, uh, the VA uh, hospital, the mental uh, health hospital, 
that was there. I don't even know if that's still there. It is. Yeah. I don't, I can't speak to it uh, recently, but when I was um, working there over a decade ago, it was a big part of the community um, and the statewide veteran community. And Sheridan's an interesting place. There's a lot of money in Sheridan. There's a lot of inequity. Um, you know, that middle class is really being squeezed in those more um, resort areas. You know, Sheridan could be considered, you know, one of the more premier communities of Wyoming as far as its golf courses and its mountain. And there's a polo field there of all things. Like there's polo in Sheridan, Wyoming. Like well it is it is this kind of little oasis on the river. You know, I mean you, you when you when you come out of there and you go north towards Billings or you go south towards Casper, you get up there on on the Great Plains in a way, yeah. but it seems like Sheridan's this little green oasis of sorts down there. And uh, at least that's the way it felt to me when I was there. Well, and, you know, I was fortunate to um, have a U-Cross residency, and that's just outside of Sheridan on the plains where the Clear Creek comes through. And my family's from Buffalo, Wyoming. My grandmother was born there. My family has a, an old homestead up in the Bighorn Mountains, and a lot of my work originates there. I, I do take an old typewriter up there just for the disconnection, the experience of just having what's in your head hit the keys and not all of the digital distractions. I mean, I, it could sound cliche, but I don't care. It's something that I really value as far as disconnecting. But at the same time, I've taken um, audio recordings up there and recorded myself reading poetry in the empty cabin or recorded the stream. I'm really fascinated with these, um, these sounds and experiences of place. And that's been as as a curious person, as a, as a journalist, you're constantly collecting data from from where you're at. And so for me, that's just been another way to harvest information for my work. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And then, uh, you know, in terms of along that line to try to shift you back into maybe a couple of poems or, or one or two from that you sent me in the mail. Oh, sure. Those those poems that I mean, you must have some connection to Arkansas relative wise or something and these memory is a is a huge obviously uh, opportunity for us to mine uh, wherever we've been and come from and, and the people we've known so there are there are some couple of poems there uh, would you be interested in sharing some one of those or Absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned Arkansas and this poem, Arkansas Summer. That's the other side of my family. My father's side um, is all from, from rural Arkansas. And I was really trying to connect with my family's roots. We don't spend a lot of time in the South anymore, but you know, I kind of came of age in the summers down South and there's just a whole different experience there and trying to understand my family's own um, experience in that place. So this is uh, called Arkansas Summer. In dwindling youth, we race from pool to house. Our baby feet grow thick, soles golden gray like the paws of barn cats. Inside is barely cooled. We drape towels across our simmering bodies, slick and lean. Eyes adjust to humid darkness, heavy as the cigar in Uncle Buster's mouth. His breath is tobacco sweet, lips stained yellow from saliva-soaked leaves. He savors each cigar without smoke, chewing them to the stub. The home is not for exploring. We are invited only to the kitchen or screened porch. For adults, Aunt Imogene pours iced tea, lemonade for children. Imogene deals in hugs and kisses and cream pie for dessert. She translates conversations for Buster, born deaf and brought up on tractors. Their hands are gentle but sturdy, always working. What arguments may exist are tucked away. Still in swimwear, we still across antique rugs into overcast rooms with homestead furniture, photographs, or neatly framed. Outside, light is shuttered as we slip gently past. Nice. Thank you. Uh, I mispronounced a word. Photographs ornately framed. <laughs> ornately framed. And ornately. <clears throat> in terms of pronunciations or dialects or different parts of the country, 
uh, you, your aunt or your uh, uh, grandma or Imogene. Aunt Imogene, <laughs> yes, and Jean. Uncle Buster. <laughs> I've known several Imogenes mm. uh, in this part of the country, Mo Western Montana. Uh, I've I've known some Imogenes, and it's like you know, it's like the way that uh, well pronunciations. I mean, just. Especially if there's uh, some kind of uh, foreign language involved, with, I guess I I just I lived in Pablo, Montana, for you know quite a while, which would obviously be pronounced Pablo by most people who have <laughs> knowledge of Spanish. Uh, you know, it, it, so yeah, it is interesting language. Yeah, we had a great uh, number of interesting characters in my Arkansas family, Aunt Doopy and her barn cats, and just trying to remember that time, what it felt like to be in a really, um, what I could, what I found out later to be um, ancestors of plantation owners. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really what I remember from childhood and that very rich, deep, dark mahogany that this whole entire old farmhouse was built on. But you know, the this would become sharecropper land, you know, and before that, um, the experience was a great inequity. And so I try to wrestle with that too in my own experience and, um, and try to really understand where I come from so that, um, you know, I'm not making those same kinds of trespasses. Yeah, I mean, I and I'm still, uh, I still have to bite my tongue because I mean, I grew up with those same kind of trespasses. All, all those, all those folks, or a lot of those folks who, who, uh, who lived that legacy uh, down south, came to Mon places like Montana and Idaho and Wyoming and the Dakotas, and came north or came west. And uh, I, you know, one of my my grandmother. Uh, <clears throat> Her family <clears throat> came from uh, Missouri, Kentucky, you know, down in that country. And I mean, just, uh, you know, the language, the phrases, the expressions, the, and, you know, and, and, you know that we grew up with all that, you know, I mean, it was, a, you had to, you had to learn that this was a language of, you know, that, that's, that should not be used. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's there's an unlearning to it all too. Oh, and I oh, think exactly. most anyone who, who's grown up in America or what would become America <coughs> has a very complicated history with our past. So we still do today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, I think I think that belongs in in our work and and in how we process things. And so yeah, totally. So um uh, you know, I'm just I'm looking at my glancing at my timepiece over here. Uh, the other thing then that uh, you mentioned was uh, you're you're working on kind of a prose, uh, uh, poetry, whatever you want to uh, label it. <laughs> whatever it is, yeah. And I think that might really be a nice way to to kind of. Um, bring us full circle because as I work through all these different ideas of being a page poet or a stage poet or a performance poet or a spoken word artist, you know, when I talked to Dave Casario, I mean, poets are poets. Spoken word artists kind of came out of something just because you needed a term for it, but poetry is an auditory form. Always. And that's how it originated. And it is meant to be, it is meant for the mouth feel, you know, it's meant to be articulated and shared um, out loud. So um, I'd love to share just some excerpts from this, um, you know, prose essay or, or poetic essay, whatever you want to call it. Is this the um, House of Sand piece? Yeah, I've got a couple sections from that if, if, um, if that sounds like a good thing to share at this point. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, one of this, I remember when I read it, I, one of the sections that, you know, was most fascinating to me, I guess, was, I don't know what you're planning on sharing, but was the third section? I don't know uh, what's what sections you're you you share with whatever you want to share with us. <clears throat> yeah, and and the backstory really, since you won't get the full you know opening of the scene, I'll kind of drop us into a couple different parts. It's it's a 
it's about a very complicated relationship that happened during COVID. And I wanted to set it in second person, mainly because I wanted to experiment with that form. But I also thought that it was a way to, um, to try to challenge myself to, to bring the reader into something that was, um, that was incredibly uh, difficult and abusive. Uh, and, and how do you share that? Everybody has a different experience, especially women relate to this piece so much. Um, and so I guess I'll just share some bits of it and we can go from there. Uh, this is part of uh, what I'm calling the house of sand. The land remains warm through January. Lakes good for skating one day are unsteady the next. Warm winds rage against the sun's distance, smoothing the sandy cliffs of this deceased inland sea. You feel its cravings like a chasm you cannot fill, wildness you cannot contain, as if the air were not enough to survive, as if the miracle of self was not enough to keep going. You haven't really talked about their deaths, Mental cell lymphoma, suicide, sudden heart failure, a collapse of the lungs, overdose, COVID-19. The ones who just disappeared. Your dog who died in 12 hours gasping next to you until he could not. The soft ground allowed a deep grave next to the cat, a place to cover up the loss. Data is the new grief, a distance you can keep. Early on, the virus seemed so far away. You still leave for work, even board a plane where a woman across the aisle has her head hung so far down she must be near to her God. In a strange city, you sit in restaurants that seem expansive with idle staff. By day four, museums and parks are closed, but bars still spill onto the sidewalks. On your last day in the city, it is also the last day of incoming flights from overseas. And still, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea to eat with your hands, grab a bag of candy and touch each, each piece. But it also doesn't seem out of line for your boss to ask you to work from home, at least for a couple of weeks, and to thank you for putting yourself in harm's way. The friend who picks you up at the airport, that is the last hug you'll receive for months. Then the letters begin. Then you make a call to the number given on the third letter slipped in your mailbox. Information begins to spill over and you feel flooded like the valley once was. The swollen rivers are like does in May standing on bluffs with young inside. The letter writer points out the blue of bluebirds in springtime, the brightest they will be all year, molted and looking for mates points out the swans among the geese, the wood ducks from the mallards, the eddies with rotted fish where, the eddies with rotted wood where fish mingle, the raptors and the crows mistaken for raptors, the ravens mistaken for crows, the difference in interstate travel and dirt roads. He'll change the lyrics to John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads and sing of Montana's heaven and you'll find it's perfect. He offers up dry spots in early summer's snow, the high country swinging from his boots as he waits for you to find him each weekend. You cry every time you crest the mountain, see the snowy peaks that have watched you since before you were born, a well in you that you didn't understand, except that such a tie to place is the only thing that makes you feel whole. You call your cousin on Mother's Day, the first without her mother, and you hold the phone while she weeps, insists that she isn't crying much anymore. You feel the expanse closing between no contact and being touched, hugged, hearing that someone loves you, and not just from your parents, but someone who doesn't have to, not really. By campfire light, he reads you a dog-eared page from your E.E. E. Cummings book, the page you hoped he'd find because it says pretty much what you always wanted to say to someone, that you carry their heart. You carry it in your heart. For you know what is keeping the stars apart, and you shall ever be tied to fragile earthly delights. He will pick you delicate flowers that emerge in the harshest conditions, and you'll remember those roots are there, holding the world in place. So this is the beginning of this COVID relationship that starts with letters and, and evolves from there. And it starts like a fantasy, but as the pandemic continues, you know, it, uh, you, you begin to see this person for who they truly are. And, and, and by then, you know, it's, it's a trap. Um, it feels like it's too late. So here's a second section of that. Days shorten, spots begin to disappear from the fawns. 
Water slows its raging path from the mountains and begins to grow stale, bittersweet with the tinge of fertilizers. Sandhill cranes graze irrigated fields, their licorice legs appearing to bend backward as they pluck insects from runoff cycling to the streams, each time becoming murkier, warmer, filled with the plight of farmland. Soon the birds will align their feathers and prepare for flight south. Bears will leave the high country for more food sources, come closer and closer to towns. The first bear to die that year will be killed for eating livestock. There will be 21 more before summer's end. In the Missouri breaks, the upside down mountains grin with ribbons of coal as the earth gasps and the rivers go underground. Even at summer's end, the land stays warm here until the early light. When it lets go, it's scorching into a dusty cradle. From the ridge where you're camped, a band of sun begins to rise as the night hawk circles, its buzzing wings sounding a morning alarm. The quietest he becomes is when the moon sets, giving away its homesick light. You're lean, sunlight sinking into your frame, skin changing with each sunset. You have come to believe what he says, that you are the poison, the one making everyone sick. To know what I know, you have to stare directly into the sun, he says. You watch him sink where you can float. Love him within the eye of his storm, a spin of the barrel each morning to see how he will wake. You feel his skin still hot, sunburn cracking underneath your palms. His eyes burn from opening them at sunrise like fried eggs. The only way you know how to survive is to keep moving, to stay wild, to stay. All right. Yeah, those, those that's uh, you've uh, opened a can of worms there. Uh, you, you know, it, uh, and I, I, of course, had a chance to read a little bit more of it, so I have a, even a, a, a further understanding of, uh, you know, it, it, it's always interesting. Uh, it, life brings us stories, and and then of course we're storytellers too. It's like I mean a lot of people. Uh, I remember writing poems uh, that they were based mainly on uh, you know uh, true actual uh, events and then that other people were also uh, aware of and whatnot and i'm writing it <clears throat> and of course i'm writing it so i mean i'm i'm still inventing things too it's not like, right. it's, yeah. it's, not like it's the truth and, <clears throat> and because because of sound and because of all kinds of liberties that that writers take poets in particular and uh, and then i'd show this poem to someone and I'd feel very insecure about their reaction because you know a lot of people uh, that you've known all your life westerners maybe in particular they'll look at that and go no the traces ain't right on that goddamn halter that's bullshit you can just get you know well that's up they write it off you know if there's one thing that, that's not right in it but uh, people would say oh man you just, you just did that, that you nailed, you had that absolutely perfect. It was just exactly the way it happened. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> because it's not right. A lot of times we, you, we, you, you, you use truth and fiction to create the story that needs to be written. And uh, I want, and in reading the piece that I read along with hearing you, what you just read, that kind of is the preliminary of this, this unfolding scene story which is just littered with wonderful imagery by the way i mean it, it is a, it does work like a great prose poem i think uh but but uh but is that there's this like crazy crazy there's some crazy that makes for really good stories and really good writings as we're in this halloween time of year right we know crazy really drama yeah, it's a uh... Well, I will tell you, Mark, that it is a very difficult thing to write from personal experience and to share it with the world and to create something like this that is not fiction. Uh, and to also explain how someone can find themselves in an emotionally abusive relationship. Uh, and that's why I say that it resonates with women. I read this piece from front to back and I, I pulled the breath out of the room and I felt so proud of that moment because again, when you share that out loud, it becomes an experience that other people then 
then share with you. And so for me to, to have documented what was going on and then to actually extract from it and be able to, to put it into words has been an incredible celebration. And, and also, yeah, it would be great if I could fictionalize some of these things. And, and that's where I struggle is I'm a, I'm a nonfiction soul. I am a, I'm a journalist at calling. So everything that I do, I, I do with an integrity of, of, of dialogue that is accurate of experiences that are rich. And also like, how do you describe the Missouri breaks, the upside down mountains, these ribbons of coal with the just earth, just grinning at you. And, and yeah, I mean, this is a real experience that I wanted to set in second person. And so that's where we start to move into the creative realm because I wanted it to be something that you could sit with and you could see yourself as that person who is targeted, who is broken down, who becomes the sickness and to have to then continually save a person from their own darkness and to also be wrestling with all the intensity of COVID I mean, what a, what a, you can't make this shit up, right? The, the George Floyd experience that we all collectively shared amongst a global pandemic, amongst all of the atrocities of the Trump administration. And then to just have somebody that sees you, that really sees you and to have not been touched for so long and to let that get stitched in to your fabric. And then to understand that you are not the poison how do you pull out of that so for me it's it's writing and then it's it's trying to make it relatable and I have cut so much from this that absolutely didn't belong and uh it, it's a work in progress like like everything so yeah 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 it's a yeah I mean I when you're when you're writing about something that close to the bone it's uh yeah it's a but, you know, in the end, I mean, if if in fact, I mean, because sometimes things like like this, like you say, are just they're just offered up to you. And it's like, well, there's no there's no turning away from it. it it's like this is a perfect thing that needs to be told. So you tell it. Well, and sometimes you don't know in the in the midst of it. Right. And sometimes you're just collecting these observations like I have very little idea of the migratory behaviors of birds before this experience. And now I know why bluebirds glow bright in springtime. These are all poetic details that are so valuable mm. uh, that I just collected and I didn't know what I was gonna do with them. And I had the good fortune of, of being at Ucross and getting to sit with it. And, and honestly, that is the gift. The gift of time is what you give a writer. because. Oh. <laughs> And it's something that's so hard to come by. So yeah, when's my book coming out? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. The gift of time is uh, in this culture, in this society, it, it is a real gift. Yeah, you've got to carve it out for yourself. So yeah, it's a it's a tough tough thing to pull off, but uh, but everybody, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I I uh, three weeks ago. I finally got COVID and, uh, and, and it still wants to sort of play around. And I, I keep doing this coffee thing. Uh, I have had it for, I had it two years ago in October, 2020. Um, and I, I just got my full sense of smell back and I'm like a damn bloodhound now I can smell everything. <laughs> so, you know, I, and I think we don't, we don't acknowledge how much we lose when we lose just a little bit of our our sense and so there there's just so many things adding up to why there is a darkness out there that that people are responding to and you know if you're a light shine really bright but re, you know you also got to be really careful with your light and where you put it so um it's a tough time out there and i think writing is 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 a humanizing aspect that that we all can share more of so well it's, 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 it's 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 a great effort to connect, and uh, and really that's what that's what we need uh, because of the fact that things seem to be coming apart. We need to really work at connecting. So yeah, well, I'm glad to connect with you. What a gift! I'm glad, I'm glad we finally made this connection. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we've been we've been at it for a couple of months, and uh, a lot of things have intervened on both ends of the world here for us. So anyway. 
it was a pleasure uh, talking to you, Anna, and uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully before my tour of duty is over. I hope to get over that way. Yeah, uh, you come see us in Billings. I'd love to. I I I, I need to figure out a way to you know, get over there and uh, either this fall or in the spring, one of the two. Uh, I need to make a tour before I'm done. Well, you know where to find me. So thanks right. again for everything, Mark. It was so fun to share with you. Thank you, Anna Page. We'll see you all again next week with another episode of uh, Poets in Montana. Have a good one.